Mic check, testing one, two, three. You guys able to hear me well? Yep. Praise the Lord. It's a good reminder that Jesus loves each and every one of us because the Bible tells us so. Sometimes we go through some challenges and we start to question if God loves us or if we're even lovable or if other people love us. And, uh, and it can be very difficult. So today, what I'm going to be sharing with you is... Uh, the title is How to Control Your Emotions When It's Really Hard. How many of you have found that sometimes controlling your emotions can be difficult? Maybe you struggle with anxiety or anger, frustration with others, with yourself. Maybe there has been a temptation to be discouraged. We see that God has created us to be emotional beings. We emotionally connect with other people. The, we make decisions that are at least emotionally influenced. And um, today I want to talk about what does the Word of God say about emotional, emotional fitness or emotional health or how can, we, how can we understand how to control our feelings so that our feelings aren't going to control us. Because that's really the reality. If we don't learn to master our emotions, then our emotions are going to master us. And that shows up in broken relationships, in um, unfit bodies, or sickness, or uh, mental discouragement. And it shows up in so many different ways that we don't want. So let's look at together, what does God say on this subject of how to find victory in our minds? Who is interested in victory to win the war in your minds? Yeah. Amen. All right, well then let's uh, first begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, thank you very much for the privilege that we have to come here to open your word, to understand your plans and purposes for us. Father, I pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit. Teach us how we could depend upon you. And as we open your word, I pray that you'll give me a mind that could be receptive of your spirit. Help me to speak your truth and your message. And I pray that uh, you will be with the hearts of the hearers that there, that each of us may have willing hearts and willing minds to obey all that we hear from your word. And we pray that we can really reflect your glory and your, your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been going through a series together on your seven thinking faculties. And each time that I've came here, I've shared... A, on a different, um, repeat and enlarge on a different faculty. And what we've covered so far is F, it stands for free will. And this is your ability to make decisions. God has given us all the freedom to choose. So we, and it might be surprising, but did you know that you can actually choose the emotions that you experience? That you don't have to be dictated that your emotions don't just have to run wild, but you can actually choose. You have the ability to decide what you're going to feel. And it may not, it may seem difficult. Sometimes it seems like emotions are so overpowering with regrets, with shame, with guilt, with frustration. But by God's grace, today we're going to cover some, some simple biblical principles that can help us to exercise our will to find victory. A stands for advancing memory. This is, this is your ability to remember, to uh, recognize patterns from the past, to ha memorize the Word of God. The Scripture says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not what? Sin against thee. So God has given us His Word through memory to help strengthen our, our, our uh, decisions. Who remembers what C stands for? It's clear what? Does anyone know what the, what the faculty is? Perception, yes. Clear perception. This is, our, this is our mind's ability to interpret the experiences of life. What is the meaning that we're going to attach to the events that happen? What is the story that we're going to say? The perception is, is uh, where the meaning comes from. And, and meaning equals emotion. When you change your meaning, you change your emotion. And we'll look more into that soon. Uh, we also talked about, I believe the last one we talked about was unique what? 
imagination. It is your ability to see a future that is not yet present, to be able to solve problems, to be able to explore new possibilities through Christ. Jesus said, with, with God, all things are what? Possible. And that's through the imagination that we are able to, to see things that uh, see the invisible and to be able to, um, to, to solve problems that we face. And today what we're going to be looking at is L, which stands for logical what? Reason. Logical reason. This is the faculty of reasoning that helps you to reason from cause to effect and understand there's a reason for every effect. There's a reason for every emotion. There's a reason for every feeling that we have. And once we could find the source, if we can find the reason, then so many... Then we are able to find control over our, our thoughts and feelings. T stands for timely intuition. Y stands for youthful faith. We're going to be uh, looking at, really, how can you exercise each and every one of these faculties as it relates to reason to control your emotions. This is what we're going to be looking at. Jesus uh, puts it this way. I want to ask, your character is made up of what two things combines? Thoughts and feelings. Well, how do we know that? What does the scripture says? say? In uh, Hebrews 10, 16, the scripture says, This is a covenant that I will, make with the, I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their what? Into their hearts. And into their what? Minds will I write them. So where does God want to write your laws? His laws? In your hearts, it's your emotions. In your mind, that's your thoughts. It's your thoughts and your feelings combined that make up the moral character. We see in, in God's law, we have a transcript of God's character. When God wants to stamp His character upon us, when He wants to restore what's so beautiful. Someone, I was doing a Bible study with someone uh, last week, and we were looking at how when God came in this plan of redemption... It was not his desire to simply send his son to die for us and resurrect so that we could be redeemed. But the plan of redemption includes restoring in man the image of God that was lost. He wants the full restoration and that putting his character in our hearts is not only the thoughts of Jesus, but even the emotions of Christ that have you ever asked, a lot of times there's like these uh, wristbands and people would ask this question, WWJD, and they would use it to help overcome these tough situations. You guys remember that phrase, what would Jesus do? And a lot of times we ask like, okay, what would Jesus do? Or then sometimes we take it a step further and we ask, well, how would Jesus think about this situation when someone rubs us the wrong way or when we see mistakes that we're feeling or when we see mistakes in ourselves and we beat ourselves up we're like ah such a failure it's like oh smart move enoch that was dumb and we're, we say these sarcastic comments we would never say about others but then we say it about ourselves and i think few people ask the question how would jesus feel about this situation because if you think about the character restoration that God wants to bring in all of us, it's not just the thoughts alone. It's not just the actions. If the thoughts are right, the actions will be right. But it's also the emotions of Christ. And it seems so, it's, it's always interesting to me to see how often different pastors, preachers, or um, church leaders have represented emotions as something like, oh, you just ignore that, stomp on your feelings, God doesn't care about your feelings and ignore that you put your feelings aside and then make your decisions, which I don't believe that God really created us to ignore the feelings, but he gave us the mental faculties that we can choose how to think. Because if the thoughts are right, the feelings will be right. And the, if the thoughts are wrong, then the feelings will be wrong. So we don't have to ignore them or stomp on them or hide them under a rug because there's only so much you can fit under the rug before you start tripping over stuff, right? And that's what happens when we stuff our emotions in a bottle and we're just like, Ugh, I don't want to deal with that. And we just distract our mind. 
There's only so much you can fit in the bottle until it explodes. And then you have outbursts of these emotional um, reactions of maybe anger, of you're saying cutting words to people you care about, or you start uh, making decisions that you regret, or if you have health goals, you just go back into the emotional eating and start gouging, uh, like gorging on the, uh, the foods that we're trying not to do. Just bad things happen when we try to stuff or ignore our emotions. So um, I believe that God gave us reason to help to dictate our emotions, to help guide our emotions. So how, where is it best to uh, reason from? In Acts, in Acts 17, verse 2, you can turn with me in your Bibles to Acts 17, 2. Uh, the Apostle Paul says something very interesting about the faculty of reason. And um, he, he, the Word of God shows us that the best place to reason from of how we can reason a gift that God has given to us. In Acts 17, 2, the Scripture says, And Paul, as his manner was went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the what? Out of the Scriptures. So the gift that God has given to us is the Scriptures so that we can reason from cause to effect. I see that there's a reason why things happen. And one of the things that I absolutely love about the Word of God is like B.C. Enoch, like before Christ, I was very rude. I was inconsiderate. I didn't have very many friends. I was cold. I was, I desired to, to have friends, but I wasn't friendly and I was annoying. So it was, uh, I didn't, it seemed like I was like walking in the dark and I would stumble. I'd fall, bump my knee and scrape. And I got all these bruises. I'm like, man, life is not working for me. Life isn't working for me in my relationships, in my family, in my school, in my just like in my skills learning. I mean, I'm just not doing very good. And it wasn't until I was introduced to the Word of God and I found that the Bible had so many answers to questions I didn't even know that I needed to know. And I started to read like, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Ding, ding, ding. If I'm feeling lonely, if I'm feeling like I don't have the friends I desire, the Scripture's like, you got to be friendly. And I didn't know how to be friendly. And so I started to read and sing. And I read verses like a soft answer turneth away wrath. I'm like, oh, because I would give cutting answers. or always have the last word or, or just say these annoying things that would tip people over the edge, push people's buttons. And I'm like, okay, so I got to give soft answers. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. I was sarcastic at other people's expense. I would make fun of people. And... But as I started to understand there's a, re there's a reason for my pain, for the suffering that I experienced. And it often went down to there's some sort of violation of a principle in God's Word. There's a scripture that shows the reason that I'm experiencing what I am. And the more that I could align my decisions with the will of God, align my thoughts with the, with the scriptures, the better my life got. And it made me just want to learn more. I got my hands on these 28 study guides from Amazing Facts. I bought them on a Tuesday and I had them finished by Thursday while I was going to school for six hours a day because I couldn't get enough of it. And the more that I learned, the better my life got, which made me want to learn more and apply more. And it was just extremely eye-opening to me. I was 16 years old at the time. And, um, and so... When we're dealing with the faculty of reason, God has given to us His Word, His Scriptures, that we can, uh, we can see that. In fact, we read in the Scripture reading, uh, Isaiah 1.18, it says, Come now and let us what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Did you know that God is a reasonable God? God doesn't just expect you to have blind faith that you could follow Him without giving you sufficient reasons to base your faith. And that's what's really encouraging, is God wants to reason with you. He's given you this faculty that cats don't have it. They go by instincts. And sometimes I see cats doing something like, why? Why would they do that? But sometimes there doesn't have, it's not like they're reasoning to do it. They're just instinctually chasing out after the, uh, the bird and, and leaving a dead bird at, at your foot 
just trying to give you a gift or something. It's like, I don't want that. But um, there, God has given to mankind, and he's made us different than the animals. He's given us reason. He wants to reason with us. So how do we do that? Let's look at these faculties. F is free will. So free will, the will helps to follow through when things are difficult. Um, the will, excuse me, the will allows you to stop making feeling-based decisions and start making what I like to call faith-based decisions through your faculty of reason. We get to choose. Even if we feel like saying something sharp or cutting or saying, like expressing words that are going to bring discouragement to ourselves, like, ah, oh, I can't get anything right, or I just keep messing up. Um, it, our will allows us to make faith-based decisions. And what do I mean by faith-based? Uh, Corinthians says, the, uh, well, Romans says, the just shall live by his what? Faith, not feelings. And uh, Corinthians says, we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. So um, our faith-based decision is like we walk by principles. We, make, we live by the decisions that we make are based on the biblical principles. And the more that we can reason from God's uh, word, that we can reason out of scriptures, that the reason why we do things is because there's a thus saith the Lord. Because the, the scriptures reveals to us how to eat, how to communicate, how to um, interact with each other, how to make decisions. The more that we can do that, God gives us the will. We are a free moral agent. The, the really encouraging thing is, although like demons can influence our emotions, they cannot force the will. Did you know that God loved you so much that he gave you freedom to choose? That if he just forced you to, to, make, to follow him, would that really be love? But Satan would love to force you. But did you know that not even God can force you? Not even the enemy can force you? That you, your power to decide is one of the most powerful forces that exists in the universe because of the free will that God has provided each of us. Satan cannot control your decisions. He can influence you, but you get to decide what you focus on. You get to decide what you say, what you do. And that's good news if I've ever heard it. Now, all right, we talk about this, this uh, free will. How does, how, what has God given to us or, uh, to control our feelings? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 10.4. What has God given to us to control our feelings? This is a scripture song. Uh, we, are, we are going to read 2 Corinthians 10.4. Roger that, 10-4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not, what? Are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. Interesting. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Whoops. Uh, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every what? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. So God, even your thoughts, God wants to be subject to the will of God and your feelings under reason and the scriptures. So what's really powerful about this is that we can actually cast down the imaginations of thoughts, all these high thoughts, all these things that want to, what's a high thought? It's something that is going to speak against God's word. It's going to be contrary to the scriptures and bringing every thought into uh, captivity, uh, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So um, our thoughts wasn't given to us just to run wild and uh, without any level of restraint. And the good news is we can restrain our thoughts. And it's interesting to me that um, a stronghold... I understand that a stronghold is something that um, the enemy has told us a lie, that we, that we, for one reason or another, chose to believe that lie. And then we built a fortress of stories or evidences or experiences that are really 
tw- uh, a misuse of our perception twisted into to basically believing that this lie is true. And, it, and, it, and what God is saying is that even these strongholds can be pulled down through the mighty weapons of our warfare, which is what? What is the sword of the Spirit? The, the, wor- the Word of God. So God has given to us words to be able to wage war in our mind and win the battles of the minds. So the words really matter. Words make a big difference. And um, we got to be careful to the words that we're saying and what we focus on. Because I, I'm going to share with you uh, three, three steps to change any painful emotion in 90 seconds or less. I've shared this sometimes, but I know that repetition deepens the impression. And I share because it works really, really well. And uh, those three steps are as followed. There, there's, well, first of all, it's good to know that every emotion has a pattern. And when you could understand, recognize what that pattern is, it's, um, it's, it's like cause and effect. There's a reason why we feel like lonely. It's, it's, uh, it's these three, these three, there's three reasons why we feel anything. And if you could identify the pattern, you disrupt the pattern. If you change the pattern, then you change the emotion. Like, um, well, I'll just share. The, the first step is to change your focus. Um, what we focus on, we find. If there, there's two things that we could always be focusing on. We're either focusing on what's missing or we're focusing on what we're grateful that we have. And any time that we're focusing on loss, we're going to feel like we're losing, like we're discouraged. We're going to feel like, uh, like we are broken or that we're missing out on opportunity, losing time, wasting time or, or wasting opportunity. Any time that we're perceiving, like focusing on what's missing, then um, we're going to be discouraged. But you can't focus on loss and what you're grateful that you have at the same time. The antidote for anger is gratitude. The antidote for fear, anxiety, is gratitude. And what's interesting is when we are, like, you can't feel angry and grateful at the same time. What, um, sometimes we can be, sometimes we can be so caught up in what maybe someone has done to me or maybe like our past decisions and we look at the regret from our past and what we didn't do and what we wish we did and it's uh it puts us in a funk it puts us in a in a very uh in a state of like it's not really a a learning state i believe there's two types of states i like to call one is a learning state where you're going to grow you're going to make good decisions you're going to have high energy you're going to be thinking of the thoughts of christ it's you're learning and the other one is, is a losing state where you're focusing on what you didn't do, what you don't understand, what you don't have enough of, and how poor the past has been and how life is happening uh, to us. And, and um, these, depending on what state we are in, like every, every joyful emotion fits under a learning state. Every painful emotion fits under a losing state. And when we change our focus, we change our feelings because feelings follow our focus. And, um, and you, know, you know what is the number one thing that will dictate your focus? It's questions. The questions we ask ourselves is what is deciding what we're focusing on. And so if we ask, like, let's say I have a goal to lose some weight. I can ask, man, why am I so fat? And if I ask, why am I so fat? I'm going to start coming up with answers and going to be think, well, it's because I like food too much, because I hate exercise, and because I'm lazy, because I, um, because I'm, I'm like whatever. And we could go through all the list of why I'm fat, but are those answers going to help us feel encouraged to make a different decision or to to reach that health goal? No. So a better question could be, why do I want to? succeed? Why do I want to lose weight? Why, why am I committed to this journey? And I can think, oh, because I want more energy, because I want to glorify God in my body, because I want to 
Like for me, when I was overweight, I wanted to be able to breathe and, and keep up with my friends because I was always the fat kid going on walks where I just remember always being behind and, uh, and then they would wait and catch their breath, wait for me. And then I'm like huffing and puffing. I finally catch up to them. I'm like, oh, good. And then they're like, all right, guys, let's get going. And I'm like, no, I just started my break. And then I go huffing and puffing again. I was always getting left behind. I felt isolated from others. And I remember going to this youth camp where I gave heart to Christ. And they're like, whoever gets to the top of the mountain gets to eat first. And for whatever reason, our team would always get there first. But I'm like holding these people back. I'm one of the fattest kids in, in this camp. And, but I'm so grateful that some friends came behind. And they all went to the top but me. And the counselor would come behind, put his hands on my back, and we're just going up the hill. And I'm just like, thank you. Just, I felt 50 pounds lighter with his hands on my back. And, and, uh, but I realized like, it made me feel bad because I was dragging everybody down. And so for me, if, my point is, if you ask a question of like, why, like, why am I so uh, fat? Then it's like, we're going to get those answers. Jesus said, ask and you shall what? receive. So if you ask a lousy question, you're going to receive what kind of answer? A lousy answer. And how do you think you're going to feel? Lousy. But if you ask a great question, you're going to get what kind of answer? A great answer. And how do you think you're going to feel? And do you think that you make, you, you make better decisions when you feel lousy or when you feel great? Great. So I believe a lot of, a lot of life is about learning how to, how to influence our emotions so we can feel great more often and make better decisions. We can learn more. I remember when I was studying the Word of God and I was studying the Scriptures and I didn't understand what I was reading. It was so frustrating to me because before, before Christ, I only read like maybe six books and I just didn't read it much. I had a small vocabulary. I was reading the Word of God, and I felt like I didn't understand most of it. And it was frustrating to me, because the whole time I was focused on what I'm missing, and how, all the stuff I don't get, and all, all that I'm losing, and I'm discouraged. Now I'm in a losing state, and I'm trying to read the Word of God and find counsel and instruction and a reason to keep going. And like, do you think I was encouraged to keep studying? No, that was a trial. And I know a lot of times when we're opening the Word of God and we're trying to find direction from God and answers from God, and we're reading, and the whole time we're focused on what I don't get, don't understand, how most of it doesn't make sense, we get discouraged, and then we no longer stay consistent with spending time in God's Word. Whereas what happened for me when I got a breakthrough is I flipped the script, and I started to focus on, let's say I only understood like 5% of what was being said. I would focus on that 5% and say, wow, I'm glad to have gotten that 5%. Then the next time I read or the next time I hear a sermon or next time I'm studying like prophecy or something, then I'm, I'm like grateful for that 5%. And then it, I get like this repeat and enlarge. Now I understand 10%. I'm like, oh, wow, that's 10% I didn't have before. So I'm grateful about that. And then next time I start to understand like 20% and then it gets like 40% and then it's just my comprehension was getting better but it wasn't until I changed my focus and, and I didn't at the time know that's what I was doing but as I reflect I realized that's how studying the Bible became a lot more enjoyable and understandable is not focusing on everything that's going over my head because the human brain has a tendency to generalize and and it and it's like if we miss even if we miss 90% of what's being said, we like to say these phrases that's like, oh, I don't understand any of it. Well, is that really true? I mean, I get like 10%. I get some of it. There's some things I, I, I can be grateful for if I allowed myself to be. And that makes a big difference. So asking yourself the question when, you're in a, when I'm in a challenging situation, it's like, what's great about this situation? Um, what's... Uh, what can I learn from this experience? What, uh, what am I grateful for about this problem? And it's not just like when you're going through, uh, I was explaining this to someone, um, and I was, I was sharing how it, it's not just about um, if we're going through a hard time, thinking like, well, what's just random things I can be grateful for? I'm glad that there's a roof here. 
I'm glad that those flowers look, look beautiful. I'm glad that I have shoes. It's not like that. If we're struggling with, like, for instance, one of the first times I learned this, um, I wanted to test like how all upset is because of unmet expectations. And then I went out and I, I was like expecting, say, it's like a, a savory meal. And when I got there, it was like this fruit meal or it was this sweet meal. And I was looking, I was like, oh man. And then I, I, I like felt that I was upset. And we're talking about 90 seconds or less. This is a powerful part because at first it doesn't, it doesn't start with 90 seconds. Sometimes it was like nine days I had to recover. Other times it becomes like nine hours that you're stewing and frustrated. But then those nine hours becomes like 90 minutes. And then it becomes nine minutes. And then eventually like you start noticing that painful emotion becomes a trigger to be like, oh, let me change my focus and do these three steps. And then it becomes like 90 seconds and it becomes a lot faster. So the time and the distance becomes shorter and that's how you know you're growing. So at this time I was new and I'm like, okay, I, it's like clearly I felt this painful emotion looking at this sweet meal. I'm like, what's the unmet expectation? Or like, what was I expecting? Oh, I was expecting some savory. What did I get? Oh, it was, it was sweet. And then I was just like, well, instead of like pouting about it, ask, what can I be grateful for? Not about the, the painting on the wall, but what can I be grateful for about this, this meal that was currently causing me pain? I was like, well, I'm really glad I didn't make it. I'm really glad it was an expression of love. Someone, someone prepared that, and, I'm, and, I, and I actually like the food that's prepared, so that's nice. It was just because I was expecting something different. That's why I felt like I was missing. But when I shifted to what I'm grateful for about the problem, not just something random, that's when I found I was, I was just overwhelmed with joy and peace and happiness, and I was really glad. I was like, this stuff works. And it, this is where I started to help to develop this 90 second rule where it's like now if I'm feeling frustrated or, or discouraged or it's like uh, we're recording in, um, we were recording, oh, the, second, the second step is change your words. Um, and an example of this is like we were recording one time somewhat recently, it was a couple weeks ago, and every Tuesday I go live on Facebook and I share um, a training for our audience and then we were in the recording studio and as I'm recording I get to almost like 20 minutes into it come to find out that my microphone wasn't recording and it was like uh oh and it could be really discouraging that sometimes if you if you're expecting that you're recording and going through all this stuff but then there's zero audio and there's nothing you could do to that recording um, a lot of times in the past I would I would be disappointed or frustrated or challenged but in that moment, I was just like unmet expectation. And in far less than 90 seconds, immediately I was like, okay, what could I be grateful for about this? And I was just like, well, that means I get to do it better next time. I, have the op I see that God has given me, gifted me with this privilege to do it better. And I see, I'm like, well, I believe that this is probably going to not, this mistake won't be repeated anytime soon. And I knew that the person who made the mistake is like, well, he's probably learning from it. And then it's not, it's not as difficult. And within seconds, you don't have to be like frustrated because think about it. If I'm about to go live again and record, is it going to be a good recording if I'm in a losing state focused on how frustrated I am while trying to share that shows up in the video and it's not as, it's not as high as a service to the people I'm here to help? Same thing is, is like in our family. If we're focused on what's losing, we're not able to show up and serve the people in our family, um, our children, our clients, the, the, uh, our spouse. Just, it, we're not able to show up. So there's so many reasons to just change our painful emotions. Change your words. Change, because words have an emotional charge to it. And the very words that you choose have... Um, like carry specific emotions. Like I'll give you an example. Is there a difference if I if I say, "Are you sure about that?" or "I I don't know if that's true," or "You're wrong," or "You're a liar." Do you feel how that how how that's different depending on those words? They're basically saying very similar things, but the word choice is different, and it feels different. So. The words that we use to describe other people's actions, our actions, our situation, the words we're using 
carry meaning. Words equal emotion. And these words, when you change your words, you change your emotions. And by learning that there are some words that just bring discouragement, doubt, uh, loss, it's like, and by changing some of these words and how we, we talk to ourselves, it, it largely um, improves, improves our, our emotions and helps us to control. And the third is to change your motion. Because it is motion that creates emotion. What do I mean by that? Your, your face has like 42, over 40 different muscles in, in your facial expressions you can make. And how many of them are we using intentionally? Uh, there's been studies that have showed that even just like through smiling, through changing your facial expression, changes the emotions that people feel. We have uh, mirror neurons that are in our mind that that's, um, studies have also found that as uh, what we look at by beholding other people's, uh, like what they're doing on television, or when we see their facial expressions, um, they, they, showed, they showed people who were looking at someone else's facial expression who was very expressive, and it, it would kind of like mirror those, those emotions. And not only does it influence us to change our facial expressions, but really how we move our entire body, even our posture. Like for instance, when sometimes we're trying to learn something and we're having a hard time staying awake, we're having a hard time paying attention. Well, I would ask like, how would you be sitting? Like if you think about it now, how would you be sitting if this was the most interesting message you've, you've heard all week? And how would you be paying attention or how would you be sitting if you knew that you had to go teach this tomorrow to someone else? Like how different where sometimes people are sitting and they're just like, they're trying to pay attention and they're just, well, and, and they're like, why do I feel so drowsy? And it's just their, their posture or they're just sitting like this and just like, yeah, it's, 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 um, I really like this. This is interesting, but it's hard to pay attention. And where if we sit up and we stand up, we have erect posture. It really influences the biochemistry in our brain it changes our emotional physiology. And out of all three of these, change your focus, change your word, change your emotion, which one do you think is the most powerful for helping you to change your, your, um, your emotions? Change your emotion? Yes, absolutely. And part of the reason why is because if you're changing your focus, that if you're already in a funk and you have to like do some mental gymnastics to be like, okay, what can I be grateful about this? I don't want to be grateful about anything on this problem. It's like, that can be kind of hard, and I'm just being real. And changing your words is like, eh, no, I mean, this, this is terrible. This is a terrible situation where I've learned one of the ways we could do that is instead of saying like, oh, this is frustrating when, when it's like something happens that you don't really expect, you're like, oh, this is frustrating. Just describe it, oh, this is fascinating. If you trade your frustration for fascination, just that word choice changes your emotions. But when you're feeling frustrated, sometimes that's, uh, that's hard to do. But the one thing that works that doesn't require your brain chemistry to be in harmony with where you want to go is change your motion. And if there's a slight shift of your motion, your motion, your movement, there'll be a slight shift of your emotion. But if there's a radical shift, of your motion, there'll be a radical shift of your emotion. There's a time that I was working on a presentation, it was like a Friday morning, and I was downstairs and, and working on something, and then a family member comes down and she is upset, she is not having it, and she's angry with some other person, and I was just thinking, in that moment, I perceived loss, and I was like, oh no. This issue means that I'm not going to be able to finish this presentation. I put out, I set aside this time to be able to do this, and now that uh, now it's like very heavily emotion, like they're in its intense emotion, and now I'm getting discouraged. And I could, I could sense the emotion within 90 seconds. It's like this pain is like just like draining me. And then I remembered, oh, I can change my emotion. So the first thing I did is like as I was starting to like rest my head on the table, before my head hit the table, I stood up and I, and I stood, I moved, I took a deep breath 
And then I exhaled and I was like, what could I be grateful for about this situation? I listened to what was going on. And what's really powerful is these three steps don't only work for changing your emotions, but when you get good at change, influencing yourself, you know what you get to do? You can influence people one-on-one. -on -one. And then you can change other people's emotions. You can change their state of mind from a losing state to a learning state. And it's a powerful skill to have. And then I was able to, once I changed mine, I was in a learning state. I'm like, all right, now this is my opportunity to practice what I've been learning and teaching. And so I helped her to change her focus, her words, and her motion. And within just a few it wasn't very long she was no longer angry upset and she was she was doing much better because it not just works for yourself there's three levels of of influence number one is is self-mastery and that's a, your ability to influence yourself when nobody is looking this is what's so powerful and then the second level is one-on-one -on -one mastery that's your ability to apply these principles that change other people's emotions and then number three is one to many mastery where you're able to to influence a group influence a family influence an organization or whether that's online offline by learning these skills you're able to to influence others for good and influence them for god how many of you would like to have the ability to not only influence yourself but to influence those you care about and those that you help these the the way that we can do that is by um working on ourself. There was another time where I was working on a computer and I was in the living room, I was working on the computer and I got this blue screen of death and my whole thing just crashed. And I was like, oh no, this, I don't have any backup, I don't have this saved, like my computer just crashed and it's gone. And instantly it's like, praise God for, for brothers because Kamran saw the situation and he was learning this stuff too. And then he just asked me from across the room, he's like, what's great about this situation? And I was just like, that was jarring to my mind. It disrupted my pattern because I was focusing on what's, what, what I'm losing. And when he asked, I was like, okay, what is great about this? And I started to see, it's like, well, I get to practice. I get to practice this, gain more testimonies. I'm like, I, I can believe that this is happening for me and say, hey, maybe I'm going to upgrade my computer. Maybe it's going to come back. Maybe um, I, I could just believe that all things work together for good for those who love God. So I know this isn't happening to me. This is happening for me. So I'm like, okay. And, um, and I, I just like shifted. And within a few seconds, just what I saw was utter loss and, and destruction of my laptop was now I'm like, oh, this is a great blessing that I get to experience. And it was a total shift of emotion. I was able to make better decisions, think clear, and then I didn't have to be down or discouraged, walking around with my head down and telling people, how are you doing? Oh, today was terrible, my laptop just broke, and start complaining about the weather and all these things that I don't like, and I don't have to show, shed darkness on the pathway of others, but now I can shed light. And, and you know what's powerful about it? That experience became a story that now I can share one, one to many. And, and that's a story that you can see how to practically apply it. Does that make sense? So at the very least, one thing that I often do is, what could I be grateful for about this? I'm like, well, not if I overcome, but when I overcome in this experience, it will be a story that I can share to help others to overcome. Because am I the only one in the room who's ever had a broken computer or phone or device that just crashed on them? No. So that, the, the good news is we're not alone. So if, if just that alone, that could make a big difference. So, three steps to change any painful emotion. At the beginning, it may not be 90 seconds, it might be nine hours, but if you keep applying these principles and you review them and think about them, you could even listen to this uh, sermon again uh, as many times as it takes and you'll learn how to apply it and it gets better and better, easier and easier. So, uh, free will. We're not probably going to go through everything, but um, I did want to cover that thoroughly. So, free will is a faculty of the will and A stands for advancing memory. Memory helps you, memory helps you to recognize patterns in your past experience. 
and knowledge to come up with sound reasoning, to make uh, reasonable conclusions. The, um, e even, even like what I'm sharing today, these, these, uh, if you could remember this, the faculty of memory will help you to remember the principles, remember the scriptures that are going to help, to help you to control your emotions, to make better decisions. We're going to move on to clear perception. Another example is um, clear perception. See, many of you guys know that we had, uh, uh, we had a van, and the uh, mom and Meji were on their way to Spokane. They had this idea that they were going to go on to um, go learn some stuff about health. And on the way to pick up Meji, mom, I mean, there's a lot of snow. And someone was just going faster than they really needed to be. She was, well, she got rear-ended. And it totaled our van. And it left us without a vehicle for a while. And the good news is, like, in this moment, it could easily be like, oh, no, we're, we just lost our car. We're dependent upon that vehicle. This is going to make everything more difficult. We just, so it's like focusing on this loss and, and this unmet expectation and all this pain. But instead... Perception, the faculty of perception is a story that you, that the meaning that you attach to the experiences. And the powerful thing is, these events of life have no inherent meaning of their own, only the meaning that you give it. God has created us with this beautiful gift to cr create and attach and choose the meaning that we're going to put to the experiences of life. So, um, and part of the way we do that is through the story that we s tell. And, our, and we're making up stories in our head all the time. So um, the story that I could make up is, well, that means we're going to suffer. That means we just lost a bunch of money. That means that, um, that, means that like, it, we, I can make up all these stories. But the story that I chose to make up is say, hey, that means we're going to get a better vehicle. That means God's going to provide something even better. And we love this, this van. I mean, it was a dream car. We prayed for every specifics, and God just provided tremendously. And, and the, meaning, the story that I made up was like, hey, th through this, we're going to get an even better vehicle. And I know that God's going to provide, and uh, it's going to be a testimony. And, and so that, again, that meaning, that story helped me to, to go through. When, mo when mom called, she said, hey, I got smashed in the back and I don't know if the van is drivable and she was able to handle it fairly well um, even though it wasn't her vehicle and um, she was able to handle it well I was able to handle it well and God truly he provided a little bit later we found a vehicle that is a lot better than this one and it's I mean God and we even with our insurance it covered uh, almost the same price that we paid for it is what we got back after driving it for tens of thousands of miles, uh, maybe over 100,000 miles or somewhere around there. And, um, and, it, and God provided to be able to buy and upgrade a, a better vehicle, newer vehicle, which we were in need of. So I remember the story, and I've shared it here before, that how God provided my first car. I, I saved up blood money and I donated my plasma to try to um, save up enough funds to buy my first vehicle. And finally, I got this green Geo Metro and I was out there giving Bible studies. I was on my way to drive like two hours to these Bible study contacts. And I'm driving with this cliff on one, like this big cliff on one side of the road and a big drop off into a lake on the other. And there's a narrow highway in the middle of nowhere. And I'm going up this hill in this little Geo Metro. You know, they got like those little lawnmower engines that they put in a vehicle. And, and so I'm going up there and, I, and it's going huffing and puffing. It goes bang and it explodes. I just hear this big bang and I'm like, what is going on? pulled to the side of the street, and I'm just like, I had this, this car for two weeks, and I saved up for months to afford it. It was the first vehicle I ever had. And I'm just like, what does this mean? And, and that, that's what we have to ask. We have to ask, like, what does this mean to us? And, and through the faculty of memory, God brought back to my remembrance, okay, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, and I added, including this broke down car. How? I don't know. Another verse that came to mind was, was James. Beloved, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. 
How many people go through problems? They're like, what a joy. I look forward to these temptations and trials. Yeah, it's not usually the first thing that goes through our mind. But I was thinking, well, it's like, count it all the joy. So I can have joy in this experience. I don't know what the future holds, but I made up a story in my head. That's called the perception. Because we make up stories all the time. Like, for instance, like mom and Meji, they made, it, they made up a story. We're, we're going to go to... We're going to go to Spokane, we're going to go to these stores, we're going to go meet, meet the, this man who is really knowledgeable at health, and they made up a story. Like, you don't know if you're going to do that. At any time, you could get into a wreck, or someone else can derail, or like a, a thousand things could happen. But that's a story you made up in your mind. So my question is, if we're already going to make up stories of what the future holds, why not make up a story that is empowering, that is encouraging? Why assume the worst case scenario why assume the worst because you are you're going to be experiencing feeling you're going to be living whatever those stories are that you make up so uh, that's through the faculty of perception and um, and god really provided a better vehicle and um, i praise god for that Amen. so here's something practical you do it's an exercise a lot of times we think we're thinking but we're actually listening and what do i mean by that is we're listening to either God's voice or listening to the enemy's voice. And he wants to whisper in our ears a lot of this discouragement. So an exercise that I have my students do, and I've done, and it's been so powerful, is to start doing like an audit of your thoughts. Start paying attention to what are the thoughts that you're thinking, especially when you are feeling discouraged. When you are feeling these painful emotions, and we're talking about how to control your emotions, even when it's hard. And, when, and write it down. And I would say write down these two types of thoughts. Number one, you, there are, it's either a limiting belief, and limiting beliefs are going to make us feel limited and feel discouraged, or it's a liberating truth. Limiting beliefs are based on scarcity, or based on what we don't have, we don't understand, what we're losing. A liberating truth is based on the truth in God's Word. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you what? free and you'll be free indeed. So if we want to be free from the control of our emotions, I have found one of the most effective ways is to recognize what is the limiting belief. Example, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough support, I don't have enough knowledge, or let's say maybe uh, you're taking on a new responsibility you've never done before. And you're like, well, I don't know enough for this. Or maybe you get asked to give a health nugget and you're like, oh, I don't have enough health knowledge. Or maybe, like, I, I know that sometimes someone, uh, sometimes people just, they take on new skills and they're just like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. And it makes us feel fear and scared and afraid to take the steps forward. So instead, what I like to say is once, whatever the thought is in your mind, write it down. And when you write it down, label it as a limiting belief and then replace it with a liberating truth. And what I will share is I always have more than enough resources to do what God has called me to do. And 2 Corinthians 8.18 says, If there first be a willing mind. What kind of mind? A willing mind. It is acceptable according to what a man hath, not what he hath not. Is that encouraging? So, in other words, and, and notice how this is kind of structured. This is a limitation. Write it down, like literally. If it's on your phone, digitally, write it down. A physical page, digital page, whatever you do. Write down the limiting belief because every painful emotion will always be connected to a thought. This is a thought. And this is a, is a liberating truth. And if I really believe that, hey, I always have more than enough to do what God's called me to do, then I'm going to be willing to give a health nugget. I'll be willing to take on a new responsibility. I don't need to know everything in order to share something. And by and that could be a liberating truth. I don't need to know everything in order to share what I know. Sometimes I've tell myself because like in speaking it's it could be really uh, fearful to share. It's like, oh man, what if people reject or what if what if people are don't like it or what if like those thoughts go through my mind constantly. And what I have to remember too is like I don't have to know everything. God only expects me to share what I know. And that is so liberating and it frees me to be able to share with other people. Um, and especially as I started speaking when I was 17, 
and sharing with people who have been studying the Bible for longer than I've been alive, sometimes twice my age. And I'm like, what am I going to have to share with them? It's like a limiting belief. But then I'm just like, well, I can share my story, my testimony. That's more than enough to make a difference. And I was shocked by how people would come up and say, thank you so much. That message was impactful. That was really helpful. I like how simple it was. I thought because I'm like a child and so young that I wouldn't be able to impact them at like some more complex way, but it was actually the simplicity, the childlike faith that they appreciated. And I, I didn't expect that. But it's because you and I always have more than enough resources to do what God's called us to do. Insert whatever the problem is that makes you feel pain or discouragement or doubt or insecurity about moving forward. And then um, this is a liberating truth. Sometimes you could borrow it from people. You can ask people who have results that you want and you're like, why do you do that? Why, like, how do you handle fear with uh, speaking to people and borrow their belief as you build your belief? Uh, another way that this, this works is, um, what's really powerful is you can actually create a group chat on like Messenger or uh, WhatsApp. And on these, uh, you can create a group chat. Sometimes you can message yourself. How many people knew that you could message yourself on some Messenger apps? See some hands, people like send notes to themselves. Note to self, that could be helpful. Um, yeah, so what I found is that taking even another step, sometimes the notes itself just has a bunch of stuff. But if you actually create a group that's designated for keeping note or capturing some of these ideas as they come, um, you, what I'll do is I'll just invite three family members and ask them, hey, what's the shape of Italy? And they're like a boot, and I kick two of them out. And so then it's me, myself, and I. And I got that group going, and, um, and, then, and then we could do this. So this is one of my students who put this together, and... Um, and you can do it on Messenger, WhatsApp, wherever you do that. Just the goal here is to be convenient and fast while it's in your mind. The less, uh, and if it's fast for you to write it on a piece of paper, like more power to you. Go for it. This is a digital way that I find helps really well. So here's an example. Limiting belief. So she was feeling really discouraged in a moment and she was just like not sure how, or she was learning these skills about recognizing, removing, and replacing them. So she found limiting belief. I'm a failure because others can do things better than me. And that makes it hard to move forward. So liberating truth, I am exactly where God created me to be. And I do not compare myself with anyone. There is no competition. And if you really believe there's no competition, then other people's abilities has nothing to do with my ability to share. Like I'm not the best preacher. I'm not the best singer. I'm not the best speaker. And I know there's other people who do it way better than I can, but it's like I have no competition. And then what I would do to maybe improve it, and, it, and you don't really have to do it in the moments, but if you go back and review, what's cool is this belief, like because other people can do it better than me, is a belief that comes up again and again and again. When you change the goal, this belief always comes up for that individual. And the way that, that she can overcome it is the same words. To, that's the weapons of our warfare. They're, they're not carnal, but they're mighty. This is how you pull down strongholds. And because this shows up many, many times, there's another time uh, she had the opportunity to share at one of our events. We had a workshop we were doing for our clients. And, and, I, sh and, um, and, she, and I was like, hey, could you teach on this topic? And first words out of her mouth, she's like, I don't think I'm the best person to do that. And if, and if you notice, it's the same pattern. Other people can do it better than me. And I said, well... Like, yeah, it's like that is the reason you feel that way is because it's a pattern. That's just a pattern that comes up. Doesn't matter what the goal is or whatever the new object is. It's like that fear is always going to come up. But the truth is, it's like even if there are other people, you, you have enough to share with them. And it was just like a passing comment. And I could do that because I have rapport with them. And then she realized, she's like, oh, yeah, that is a pattern that comes up in very different areas of life. And when you could recognize what are the limiting beliefs that I tend to gravitate to, it's like, what is your favorite flavor of pain? Each person is a little different. Uh, for me, I tend to go towards like apathy or overwhelm. Those are things that I start to gravitate towards. But maybe overwhelm isn't for you. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's self-pity. Maybe it is frustration. Or maybe it's it's regrets like the devil has a different flavor for you but what i would i would suggest is 
as you start writing down the thoughts, you will notice when you're in a painful experience, when you write it down, label it as a limiting belief, liberating truth. Even if you don't know what the liberating truth is, just leave it blank and, and so that you can know there is another way to think about it and ask. And you'll start noticing patterns that they keep coming up over and over and over. And what's great about this is you can only feel overwhelmed. Like for me, I can only feel overwhelmed. All overwhelm can only exist when there's a specific pattern that is in place. When you change the pattern, you change the emotion. Overwhelm cannot exist without that scenario. So one source where I often feel overwhelmed is like, I see all these things I got to do and I feel like they need to be done yesterday or I needed to get it done right now. And that feels overwhelming. But then when I realized, oh, I could prioritize them, I could do them at different times. I didn't do them for these three months in the past and like the world didn't fall apart. So I could wait a little bit further. There's just different ways of viewing it. And it's the same way to just change the words and it changes the emotion. Here's another example. Uh, one is like, when I mess up, that means that I'm a failure. Liberating truth is, my mistake means that I am growing and learning and becoming a better person. W wouldn't you feel better if like you made a mistake? And this is what I mean, where like, you made a mistake. So that is a, that's, that's a, that's a fact, that's an event. But that event has no inherent meaning, only the meaning that you give it. So you can choose to say, well, because I messed up, that means I'm a failure. But you could also choose that, well, I messed up, that means I'm growing. That means I'm trying something new. That means I'm becoming a better person because I'm learning from the experience. You can say I'm losing from the mistake, or you can say I'm learning from the mistake. One's going to make you feel lousy, and one will make you feel great, and it'll help you make better decisions. And... Uh, and that's a powerful reframe. So my encouragement here is to just have a practice where you can trace your, whenever you're feeling a painful emotion, write it down. Be, be aware. What is the limiting belief that's causing the emotion? What is the liberating truth that would combat that or could replace that? Because if you think about it, like what is a thought? What is a belief? A belief is simply a phrase of words. Have you ever noticed that you can speak without thinking, but it's impossible for you to think without using words? In other words, like, uh, I, I like how Romans, I believe it's 1016 says that faith comes by hearing and by hearing words. If you hear the words of God, it creates faith. If you hear the words of doubt, it creates, I mean, the, the words of, of the enemy, the, the lies, it creates doubt. But both faith and doubt are belief. And um, so all beliefs are a phrase of words. When you start being aware of what are the phrases, what are the words that we are saying in our thoughts, that's how we overcome. That's how we get the mind of Christ. And he writes his laws, his words, in our mind and in our hearts, in our thoughts and in our emotions. And the thoughts and feelings combined make up the moral character. Is that making sense? Another, another pattern that I've, I've found that um, is not really like, it, it's like a lot of times we think our growth are when we're learning a new skill or maybe we're overcoming a particular sin that God's ha it, convicting our heart on and we think that this victory needs to look like I start with no experience and I just go up the steady growth and I'm like, yes, onward to victory. And this is what we expect the new skill looks like, right? But this is what it actually looks like. And, and this is what our journey is. And it's like, man, this, this. So we have some initial victory and we're like, yeah, I'm getting the hang of it. And then drop. It's like, oh, no. It's like, who am I kidding? Why, why am, who am I lying to myself? I'm never going to make it to the, I'm never going to overcome this. And we get some more victory. We're like, wow, well, maybe there's hope. And then we go further than where we started. And we're just like, oh, man. This is like, and, and some people quit, where, have, you know, in Proverbs, it says, the just man falleth seven times, and what does he do? Riseth up again. But the wicked, they fall into mischief. When the wicked fall, they don't get back up, because they let their, their lows get them so low that they, 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 they don't go anymore. And so what happens is, I believe growth looks like this more so. This is more of a success path. 
And what happens is you start to notice that the, the gradual at, like, incline is upward, where your lows don't get as low anymore and your highs get even higher as you go. So I believe what God is looking for is not instantaneous perfection, but he's looking for progress. And as long as you're making progress in that direction, then I believe God is pleased with you and he's not going to completely reject you because you made a mistake. That doesn't, like, that doesn't mean he leaves you where you are. He teaches you how to grow so you can end up further along than where you started. Does that make sense? And I believe that if we have unrealistic expectations, then we are setting ourselves up for a world of hurt. But if we have proper expectations and we trust in God's strength to get us through the highs and the lows, not to be elated by pride through apparent success and not being so discouraged that we quit through apparent failures, but to see that uh, these proper expectations, I believe, like I tell my team that I, I like to see you make mistakes. I genuinely like to see you make mistakes. I'd rather see you make aggressive mistakes than passive ones. Why? Because the mistakes means that you're trying. It means that you're taking risks. It means that you're doing something new. God forbid that, that you're, you're making these passive failures. You're so afraid of failing that you never succeed. I don't believe that success is the opposite of failure. I believe it's an essential part or that failure is an essential part of success. And it's like when we're learning something new, like we started doing uh, monthly challenges. Every month we go live for five days and we teach on these new topics. There's new skills that are involved from bringing people to the event, hosting the Facebook, getting set up on Zoom, having the message in a way that it resonates with people. It's there's a lot of moving parts that we've never done before. And as a team, I would tell them, okay, our first challenge, our goal here is to make as many mistakes as we can in the shortest amount of time possible. Let's, let's get all of the, the mistakes out of our system so we could eventually run out of things that don't work and all we have is things that do work. And I'll tell you that first challenge, that, which is like an online five-day event, was really difficult. It was emotionally draining, it was stretching. It's like some of our team is smiling because they were there, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And it, it was challenging the first time, but now the time that we do it, it's smooth sailing. We could do it like, it, it's, we've got systems in place, we've got the skills, we know what to expect, we have realistic expectations. And it's just, it's a lot easier, but that's how, that's how the skills are developed. That's how we, we change, that's how growth takes place. And if you look in nature, there's, there's nothing in nature that's just straight linear growth. I mean, they all grow in different directions and, and, and different ways. Um, so it, it really helps. Where I also believe that the three most important decisions of your life is, number one, what are you going to focus on? We, in, in every moment of life, we have the ability to choose what we're focusing on. We're, and we could be focusing on how we're going to pay the bill next month. In this moment, we could be focusing on what I'm saying. We could be focusing on uh, the your your pul your heartbeat in the left earlobe of, of of yourself, or you could be focusing on the uh, the plants around. I mean, there's infinite number of things you could focus on. The most important decision of our life is what do we focus on, because your thoughts are always moving in the direction of your strongest focus. Show me your focus, I'll show you your future. And are we going to focus on things above? Are we going to focus on God's word? Are we going to focus on our failures? Are we going to be focusing on our growth? Are we focusing on the friends that we have? I, I realize like a lot of times we feel lonely and, and I believe that like loneliness is the most painful emotion I've ever experienced in my life. And I, I do not like being lonely. I don't like feeling lonely. And uh, when I felt the most alone, I focused on how people were hurting me. I focus on people I trusted and how they broke my trust and, and how I can't trust others. I focused on when people were doing something kind, I was focusing on, it's like, yeah, I'm not letting you in because I don't want to get hurt. And I was focusing on the pain. And what was happening is what you focus on, you feel. And by focusing on distrust and pain, I started to perpetuate the very thing that I wanted to avoid. And it, and it took a wake-up call with my friends well, we were at the mechanic shop and he was telling me, he, he got up real close to my chest and he's like, Enoch, 
you keep your cards too close to your chest. And he's tapping on my chest. And, and he's like, you got to let people in. There's people that actually care about you. And I was like, is that true? I didn't even know I was doing it. And, and then I heard another person telling me something similar in, the, in like the next week. And I'm like, okay, how do I do this? And um, so what we focus on. The second thing is, is what does that mean to you? You get to choose the meaning. That's a story that you make up about what you're focusing on. And I could, I could look at someone I trusted closely and how they betrayed my trust. And the meaning I attach to it is people aren't trustworthy. I can't trust people. I, the meaning I, I associate it is that people equal pain. And so I wanted to stay away from what? Pain and people. And so that was the meaning that I attached, and it created a lot of suffering. And the third is, what are you going to do about it? And it wasn't until it shifted where I wrestled with God, and, and God was helping me to see that, that I was going in a direction, in like emotionally, mentally, my mental health was going back to like before Christ delivered me from a lot of those toxic thoughts. And the, the, the mental plagues that I would go through, I'm just like, I don't want to be in that discouragement and darkness again. And that kind of freaked me out. So I was willing to explore this. I'm saying, like, Lord, how do I help? And I'm like, I don't want to trust people because I don't want to get hurt. And then I was, I was asked, and, and I realized I had to trust people. And God was showing me that I'm not, it's not that I'm going to trust people because people are trustworthy. I'm going to trust people again because God is trustworthy. And the real question is that God is like, the real question is not what if someone betrays you. The question is, when they betray you, will you still trust in me? Will you trust that I won't allow you to go through anything that you can't handle? Will you trust that I will see you through whatever I take you to? And I began to realize, wow, God is trustworthy. And, and if we really believe that God loves us and He means to do us well, then we're going to cease to worry about the future. And, and I started to have this healing process where now I trust people and distrust needs to be earned. Where before, I was like, I distrust all y'all and you're going to have to earn my trust. And when I had this paradigm shift, now when I trust people and I give that, then people become, like, they live up to that expectation. They want to be trusted. And I see that I have deeper relationships, deeper friendships. I'm able to connect with people more. I'm not all closed off to people. I could, I could encourage others more. I could share my stories today with less fear of judgment. And I've been able to connect with people so much more and be surrounded by more friends and quality friends than I've ever had in my life. Where before, I used to feel so lonely. Now, you couldn't even convince me that I'm lonely. Because I'm surrounded by people who love me. And it wasn't always like that. And before going through this process, I didn't know how to connect with people at that, in that level. So, I believe that these three decisions are we're making hundreds, probably thousands of times every single day. And we get to choose what will you focus on, what does it mean to you, and what are you going to do about it. So we're going to skip some. Um, so this is, this is how to get rid of a lie identity. And what is a lie identity? It's, it's who the enemy says that you are. And just like there's a limiting belief and a liberating truth, there's your lie identity. And then there's what I like to call your high identity. Your, what's your high identity? That's who God says that you are. And you are not your past mistake. You are who God says that you are. You are not your past sin. You are who God says you are. And sometimes, like, sometimes my team will ask, they're like, man, I, I keep messing up. Thank you for your patience. Why do you continue to, to be patient with me when I, when, when I like, keep making these mistakes? Or, or when it's like, when I'm so, like, insert identity. And I tell them, it's like, look, I don't believe that you are that limiting identity. You are who God says that you are. Sometimes you may be acting in a way that is inconsistent with who you really are, but that mistake is not who you are. You are courageous. You are dependable. You are, um, you are encouraging to people. You're not 
who the enemy wants you to think. And so we have to understand there's a difference between your, your, your actions and your identity. Your actions don't decide who you are. Sometimes we can act inconsistent with who we really are. But the way that we overcome this is, first of all, recognize. Recognize that it is the enemy's voice. Recognize whose voice is speaking to you. Recognize if I'm saying, like, I'm so stupid, or I can't get anything right, or just, like, I'm a failure, or I, it's like these I am statements of, like, I'm, I'm terrible at this, or I'm, I'm not a public speaker. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot of people who told me I'm not a public speaker, but then when they give their first presentation, it's like, man, your first speech was better than my first 50. And I'm like, God has gifted these people. But it's like, we got to recognize um, that it's a lie identity or a limiting belief, and then we remove it. And then we replace it with something else. Romans 12, 21 says, Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. So it's not enough to just remove the lies. We have to replace it with the truth. That's why I wouldn't encourage you, don't get the idea from the last experience, like uh, writing exercise I had is write down all the limiting beliefs. You do that, you're going to get yourself in a funk. It's important to write down the lie and replace it with the truth. Because what happened to the woman who the demons were cast out and she didn't replace it with, some, with something good? Seven more demons, worse than before, came and possessed her, and it was worse. So we want to we recognize, remove, and replace the thoughts. So that is dealing with unique imagination. And we got logical reason. Talked about how there's reasons for everything. And... We're going to look at timely intuition. Intuition is powerful because intuition, when trained by the scriptures, helps to provide insights and make sure that you are on the right path when it comes to making decisions. Intuition is really beautiful because it's kind of like that still small voice that speaks to you. When, God, when you hear the voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. it and it's like God's um, God gives you this intuitive insight that it may not be from some sort of like evidence that you per se saw, but he speaks to you softly. <clears throat> I believe that as we talked about, it's not enough to cease to do evil. We also have to learn to do what? Well, and the good news is it's a learning experience. Even if we've trained our mind to see the discouragement, the doubt, the fear, the anger, and to see all the loss, no matter how much we've trained ourselves to do that, we can learn to do well. We can learn to build new habits of thinking where it's actually easier. Like we talked about the 90 second rule, three ways to change your painful emotion, 90 seconds or less, where you can actually learn how to, um, how that healthy thinking becomes automatic. That right thinking becomes the easier option than going down the, the wrong path. And it's by understanding whose voice that we are listening to. I, I know that um, it's kind of hard to explain, but the best way I can have it is that um, before understanding or studying the scriptures on how to overcome these thinking habits um, and the faculties of the mind, it was kind of like my mind would just like always gravitate to just like how, how bad things were and how much I'm missing and how much I'm like messing up and how these people aren't supportive or how and like I would just like gravitate towards that but then learning where the truth will make us free and it started to free my mind from these habits and started to overcome them like I have shared with you some of the early stories where I was just learning these concepts and um, and it was just uh, it, it was it was life changing and I, and I say that um, one, it, it got to a point where I believe that sometimes scarcity is our first response. But it's like the verse says in, in um, was it, Second Peter 1, 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may be partakers of the what? The divine nature, having escaped the corruptions that are in the world through lust. 
So there's these promises, the words of God. When you make the word of God the foremost of your thoughts, when you focus on it, when you use your memory, faculty of memory to memorize it, when you allow to, to apply these principles we're sharing, and that then you become partakers of the divine nature. Where, and, and I believe that it's like in moment by moment decisions, God's divinity flashes through humanity whenever God, um, God prompts us to do good, to cease from evil, learn to do well, it's by the Holy Spirit. That's a supernatural effect. It is a divine power that through His Word is giving you power to overcome. And um, I think about it kind of like, you know, um, Spider-Man had this superpower where he said that his like spidey senses were tingling and he could sense when danger was coming and he'd just avoid it. And uh, the best thing I can think of is it's kind of like now it's like my scarcity senses start tingling or sometimes I'm hearing or I say something and I'm like, ooh, that, that sounds like scarcity and I know where that goes. And then I recognize the movement place or sometimes um, listening to someone who's going through a hard time. And uh, like, like an example that I gave earlier where someone from my family came in, they were very upset. They were angry with the other person. And I could hear in their words, it's like the scarcity senses are tingling. And I'm like, oh, I, I understand the source of those emotions. So by changing her focus, changing her words, changing her movement, she was able to overcome her anger and, and be calm and joyful. And she's ready to go have healthy uh, conflict resolution conversations. And God was able to resolve those. But like, I believe it's through intuition that can help us get to a point where um, what used to be so easy now becomes harder and we're like, oh, that doesn't really compute. That doesn't belong in our thoughts. And we have less space. We no longer let Satan's suggestions to take up room in our minds living rent free because the enemy didn't pay the price. Christ paid the, Christ, the price on Calvary. He belongs to enthrone in our minds. So... Um, one way that you can tell the difference between the enemy's voice and God's voice is the enemy condemns your identity. He works on condemnation and he works, he wants to tell you that because you failed, that means you are a failure. Or because you, um, you made a rude comment, that means you are a rude person. You're an unlovable person. And he wants to condemn your identity. Revelation 12, 10 says, Now is the accuser of our what? Brethren cast down. So he wants to accuse your identity. But when God speaks, John 6, 8, 8 says, When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he's going to uh, reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. So God, he convicts your activity. He convicts you on the behavior. He brings conviction and reproves the sin. And he shows you that is like, hey, that that decision was not good. That action was not good. And he changes your heart from the inside out. The enemy wants to because of your sin. It's so amazing. The enemy kind of like trips you up. And once you're on the ground, then he wants to put his foot on you and keep you down there and remind you of your past mistakes and say, you are a failure. You're a terrible father. You're a terrible friend. You're you're an awful person because you did something awful where God is like, look, yeah, this is awful, but I, and it's like, it's, you don't want to continue that and I will give you strength. You are who God says that you are. You're a conqueror. Through Christ, we are more than conquerors, yea, in all these things. And God doesn't, he's not here to condemn your identity. He's here to convict your activity. And, and when you could start to notice the tone of the words that are going through our mind, we can start to realize, oh, wait a second, I'm not thinking, I'm listening. I'm listening to the enemy's voice or I'm listening to God's voice. And we get to decide whose voice are we going to listen to. So that's the faculty of what I call timely intuition. God speaks to us at those times. And um, I'll wrap it up with I will end in with one last verse. What happens when we expect fearful things and when we expect the worst things? Sometimes we can go through life and like expectation, I believe, is, is a really 
powerful thing um, where sometimes even listening to this, we could listen and we could be like, okay, I don't expect that's going to work. Or we'll say, yeah, but that's not going to work. Or that doesn't, that's, not, that's not practical in this scenario. Or that doesn't apply to me. That may work for you. It doesn't work for me. I'm different. We could expect that it's not going to work. Or we can expect that, hey, this is probably something that I was missing. This is something that I could use. And then when we do it, we can expect that it's going to work out. And instead of asking, it's like, oh, what if I go through all this effort and it doesn't work? What if we start asking, how awesome will this be when it does work? How life-changing will this be for me, for my family, for the people I serve? How, how life-changing will this be when I apply the, God's Word and, and gain victory in these areas? Expectation is a powerful thing, and it will change the way that we show up and decide. But uh, Job 3.25 tells us what happens when we expect these, uh, the worst-case scenarios. Job 3.25 says, For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Did you know that the very act of expecting things not to work out will cause the very thing you're afraid of to come to pass? It becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. A lot of times when we're just expecting, uh, like we just wake up, it's like, oh, today's going to be such a hard day. And it turns out to be a pretty hard day. Uh, but when we expect God's word to do what he says he will, then, uh, then, then we, start to, we, we really start to find more strength, more courage. I mean, you could hear that 90-second rule and say, that is just hogwash. And to be able to, have, be able to change any painful motion in 90 seconds or less, there's no way that could work. But I, I learned that, and I heard, and I was like, wait a second. If it's possible for them, why can't it be possible for me? And I was like, if he could do it, then I could do it. And I chose to make it a goal. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. You're never going to reach any, any height that you don't set for yourself. So you're, you're never going to reach higher than the mark that you set. So aim high. Determine to be all that you can in Christ. And... Um, and as I did that, like I said, at first, maybe like things would, I feel bad for like nine hours, but then it starts becoming like 90 minutes. And then it's just like what used to get me down for days. Now it's getting me down for hours and then minutes and then seconds. And then, and then now it becomes more automatic. It becomes easier. And then it's like, I don't really have like just bad days anymore. It's, it's just like, yeah, there's some moments. Sometimes it, it's hours, but, but a lot of times there's seconds where it used to be many times there's all these annoyances and, and disturbances that hit me and rubbed me the wrong way, where now it's like they are so fewer and farther between. And it's because I decided, I'm like, wow, God's word is true. I'm going to apply this to my life. And I'm going to, I desire to develop the character of Christ, not just the thoughts of Christ, but the feelings of Christ too. I don't believe feelings is something to ignore. It's something to educate ourselves. We have over 6,000 words to describe human emotions in the English language. And the average person only uses or thinks about like 6 to 12 of them. I realized that my emotional intelligence was very limited. And how am I going to be able to use something that I don't really understand? I ask people like, how do you feel about this? And they're like, well, I don't want it to happen. That's not a feeling, that's a thought. And they're like, uh, well, what's, how, I'm like, how do you feel right now? And they're, they're just like, well, I don't know how to describe the feeling. A feeling is one word. A feeling is like overwhelmed, it's sad, it's upset, it's angry, it's frustrated. These are feelings. Um, but if we don't know how to identify, recognize the emotions we're feeling, we won't be able to remove or replace them in a healthy manner. So by God's grace... My encouragement is as we're going through these seven faculties, I want to equip you with your seven thinking faculties. These are seven tools that God has given to you to create the life that God has intended for you to live, to enjoy your life. I don't believe that God just gave us his word so that we could wait until heaven to start enjoying an abundant life. I believe we, God's word is when we reason from the scriptures and we apply it to our life, our life can be enjoyable today and in the life to come. 
And I believe he gives us seven faculties to do so. So let's review, and then we're going to close. So what were the, the seven faculties that we have so far? F stands for free what? Will. Yes, good memory. And A stands for advancing what? Memory. Some of you got the hint. And then C stands for clear perception. It's our ability to, to make up stories about what the meaning is going to be, how we interpret the experiences. U stands for unique what? Imagination. L stands for logical what? Reason. This is a beautiful faculty we just studied today. And T stands for timely intuition. And Y stands for youthful what? Faith. Youthful faith. God would have us to have a youthful faith. And uh, today we've looked at um, how to control your emotions even when it's hard. And um, if you want to listen to it multiple times, I mean, there's a recording. You could listen to it. I, there's a lot here. But um, I want to ask, how many of you, is it your desire to really uh, take control of your emotions? That you realize that, hey, no one says it's going to be easy. The, the strategies I shared, they're simple, but they're not easy. And, but you realize that, that, um, that God has given us tools that we can overcome. And if it's your desire to overcome, if you want to overcome for your own peace of mind, great. If you want to overcome for the peace of mind of those who, who get to interact with you, even better. And if it's your desire to control your emotions, to allow God to reign in your heart, in your mind, to direct your thoughts, to help you to, to find and experience a level of peace that is even deeper and broader than, than the past, then I invite you to close with me for a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you recognizing our great need. We see that in many ways we have trained our minds to see what is um, not in harmony with, with heaven. And Father, we realize that whenever we deviate from your principles, it's, it, uh, it has not gone very well. And sometimes the enemy wants us to believe that trusting you is going to lead us to loss, to suffering. Um, but time and time again, the more we hear the enemy's voice and we follow it, suffering is all that we've experienced. Sure, there may be pleasure of sin for a season, but it's so temporary, it fades away, and we need more than what we had before. Father, I believe there are people here that are looking for victory, that are looking for strength and courage to do things, even if they're hard, but to know that you have a power in your word. You have a power that you are offering to us to overcome, not in our might, but in, in your might. And Father, we want to take hold of your power. Forgive us where we have fallen short, where we have not perfectly reflected your character. Help us to have realistic expectations of, of um, what that growing, that developing Christ-like character looks like. And, and uh, Father, I pray that you'll help us to be patient with ourselves, patient with others. And uh, please bless the memory of those who are here as they can remember these things and, and remember your word and uh, take us and mold us as the clay in the potter's hand, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.